Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You know, my, my very favorite priest, his name is Father Targonsky. Uh, he's a little, he's a little Polish guy, and he, uh, he just retired from the Navy. He was a military chaplain, and he just retired from the Navy a couple of years ago. Um, and he was a man who absolutely walked me through my greatest period of, of spiritual and religious development that I've had to date. Um, he took me by the hand. He never let me go. And uh, he was, uh, he was uh, facilitating a mass one day, and, uh, and he's Franciscan. And um, he had been away. He had just gotten back from being in Chicago, and he was doing a, a spiritual retreat for a bunch of Franciscan sisters. And uh, at that spiritual retreat, the sisters were celebrating one of their own. Um, and she was 98 years old, and she had been a Franciscan sister for 80 years. I know, right? So they were they part of part of this retreat was celebrating her 80 years of devotion to being a Franciscan sister. And 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 Father Ski said that he was she was waiting on an elevator. They was doing it in some some place in Chicago um, where he had to wait a while for an elevator to come up several floors and get you. And he sat down next to her and he said, "Oh my goodness, sister, what an amazing amazing gift you've given us. You have been you have been faithful to God for 80 years." That's simply amazing. And, and he said, she just looked at me and she tapped him on the knee and she said, oh, Father, you have it all wrong. It is he who has had faith in me for 80 years, not the other way around. And, you know, when he told that story in Mass, I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, that, that is absolutely my story. Although, you know, I've been of far less service to the Masses than she had after 80 years of being a Franciscan sister. But truly, God has been incredibly faithful to me when I wasn't able to muster even a, the smallest, smallest bit for him. Um, my sobriety date is March 15th, 1987. Um, for the last 26 and a half years, um, you guys have put up with me in your meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, for that, I am truly, truly grateful. Um, I was born and raised in alcoholism. Larcine, as you know, every time I hear Larcine talk, I mean, she's telling this story that has so many similarities to my family. You know, my father was terribly alcoholic. He still is terribly alcoholic. Um, he got his disease of alcoholism far before I was ever born. I have no, I, I have no idea when that set in for him. Um, he also didn't, didn't love the fact that he had girl children. Um, actually, when my mom was pregnant with me, um, my name was supposed to be Dale. And um, Dale Edward was supposed to be my name. And I was supposed to be a linebacker for the Cleveland Browns. I'm not sure how he thought that they were going to produce a linebacker because they aren't enormous people. So I think that he was off in a couple of points. But then I popped out a girl, and I was an incredible disappointment to him. Um, but my, my dad's alcoholism absolutely ruled our house when I was, when I was little. And, um, and I knew my father was my very first higher power. Absolutely, he was my first higher power. The way he felt, the way he acted, it determined how the rest of us how the rest of us went through our lives that day. It absolutely. So he was my very, very first higher power, and it took me a long time. It took me a long time to be able to get him off of that pedestal and put something up there of true value. But when I was a little girl, I, I was absolutely terrified of everything. Absolutely. There are pictures of me when I'm a little kid, and I have my hair up in ponytails. I have my shoulders are pinned to my ears, and my little hands are balled up in fists. I am terrified of everything, but what I understand when I'm little is that being scared means that I'm vulnerable. Fear equals being vulnerable, and when I'm vulnerable, I'm going to get hurt, and I know that. I've experienced it over and over and over. But I watch my dad, and I learn, and what I figured out from him is that when you're angry, you're powerful. And so I decided that instead of looking scared, I was going to look angry. And boy, did I ever. I mean, really, there are a couple of those pictures where it's like, oof, I wouldn't mess with her. <laughs> Ooh, that's one tough six-year-old. <laughs> and I ran everything in my neighborhood, absolutely everything. I had a posse, and that, that group of kids, they didn't do anything without clearing it with me first. And they never challenged my authority. I ruled with an iron fist. I, had, I, never, even had to, I never had to swing. 
You know, nobody ever challenged that. I never had to fight them. But I looked, I was angry, and I was in control at all times. Absolutely. But what the, the truth of that is, I was scared of everything. I was scared of big people. I was scared of shadows. I was scared of things that moved too fast. I was scared of things that made, that made noise that I wasn't expecting. I was just terrified of everything. And, you know, there are still some noises that, I, that, that will hit me today. And one of those that just stays with me for some reason is that when I hear tires rolling down a gravel surface and I hear that popping, The hair on the back of my neck will still stand up a little, and I'll sit up real straight and make sure I'm acting right. Because the driveway coming down to our house was kind of long, and I would hear that noise even though I didn't hear the car, and I knew that my dad was coming home. You know, alcoholism has had a profound effect on me from day one. Profound effect on me. When I was nine years old, I wanted to figure out what alcohol was. I knew it was incredibly important, incredibly important in my house. It ran everything. It was very important to my dad that he drink it every single day. It was incredibly important to my mom that he never have another drop. That's basic alcoholic conflict. And, um, and so, you know, and that, that conflict absolutely shadowed the way our, our homes ran as well. And so when I was nine years old, I kept asking questions about, you know, what is that stuff, what is that stuff, and nobody would ever tell me. And I just decided at nine I was going to go figure it out for myself. And so I did. I spent the night with a girlfriend. Her parents had a bar in their basement, and she and I, and I talked her into drinking with me. You know, for her, alcohol wasn't a big deal. Her parents drank a little bit. And when they drank, they, they, you know, there was a, they, they were nice to each other, and they would dance, and they would kiss, and they would hug, and there was this really nice thing that would happen, and they would, their friends would come over, and it was just this really nice event for them, and alcohol was just a part of, a part of this and for me alcohol was running everything so to her to drink she was like well okay you know no big deal but I I was in the middle of figuring something out and that night it was a night of first for me I had my first drink my first drunk my first blackout my first hangover I mean I absolutely hit the ground running but what I remembered most the next morning was that as I drank as I was able to swallow enough of that stuff down my little shoulders came off my ears my hands let loose And I exhaled for the very first time. And I thought, oh, this stuff is awesome. I mean, this stuff is awesome. You know, I, and and what also happened for me that day is that my loyalty, my loyalty shifted from my mother to my father. You know, in alcoholic households, oftentimes you gotta pick sides. And the side I had always picked was my mom. Well, that night, that day, when I came, when I, when I was sober the next day and I realized that utter and complete release from fear that I had had and I recalled it, my loyalty switched from my mom to my dad because I now understood why he drank. I got it. Because my God, if it does this for him, why wouldn't he drink? Why wouldn't he drink? And then it occurred to me, I was like, you know what, my ma, that woman just needs a drink. <laughs> Woo! I mean, she is wound tight. You heard our scene yesterday. My mom was wound tight. And if she would just drink, everybody would get along. Everybody would get along. So fast forward six years. I'm 15 years old. I'm a sophomore. I'm getting ready to start my sophomore year in high school. And I've decided that I, you know, when I was nine years old, I decided I was going to drink as much as I could, as often as I could, period. That's what I was going to do. And I did. I did. Every relationship that I had in my life was evaluated based on whether or not you increased or decreased my access to alcohol. If you decreased my access to alcohol, if your parents didn't drink, if you didn't have older brothers and sisters, if there was no bar in your house, what, or if you were just a teetotaler, good kid, whatever, I would hang out with you at school, but that was it. You were not going to be one of my close friends. However, if you had a bar and older siblings and all kinds of things, and somehow I could manipulate your environment to get more booze for me, you were in my inner circle. And that's how I had evaluated everything. And so by the time I'm 15 years old and a sophomore in high school, what had happened for me is that the disease of alcoholism set in at some point over that six-year period. And through constantly drinking and drinking and drinking, I'd drink my way into alcoholism, and I was drinking every single day. I was unable to draw a sober breath. I was incredibly, incredibly sick, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I hadn't been able to look in the mirror to comb my own hair or apply makeup for a real long time. I hated who I had become. I hated everybody around me. I really, really was just not all that interested in living anymore. But I kept waking up day after day after day. 
And, you know, and I knew that alcohol was a huge part of that. I understood that I drank a lot, and I understood that the places that I went in order to get booze, that, they, that, was, you know, they, that was a huge part of my undoing. I understood that, but I also understood that on those mornings or on those days when I couldn't get enough booze and, then, and sobriety was forced on me, that I was unable to breathe. I was absolutely unable to breathe. And I, and I hated who I was. And I couldn't sleep because when I'd close my eyes, it was nothing more of a merry-go-round of faces and events that had happened in my life. Because the more I drank and the more alcohol I required, I had to go over to, I had to cross over to the wrong side of the tracks to get more and more. And I had to hang out with people who scared me. I had to go spend time with the people that, that my mother had warned me about. You know, there was a little, I grew up in this really tiny little town right outside of Akron, Ohio. I didn't know that I was being raised in the Mecca for Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, I don't know if that was important information at that time, but you know. But I was being raised in this tiny little town where when the coal mines started shutting down in West Virginia, everybody packed their families up and they moved to Ohio to get jobs in the factories to get the good union jobs over here, and that's how my family ended up in Ohio. And in this tiny little town, you know, every little town has it. There's that one little area of town, no matter how small it is, there's the one area in town where good people don't go. And, you know, and I knew where that area was. It was actually two blocks from my house because we weren't all that well off. So we were close to the bad people. And so, and it was pointed out to me and they're like, don't ever go over there. Don't ever go over there. Like we just go through there when we're leaving town, but we don't stop. And that's where I went every single day. That's where I went every single day. And I had no option but to go there because when I was 14 and 15 years old, I couldn't just go, I, I couldn't ride my bicycle through the beverage drive through and get a fifth of vodka and go home and drink at my leisure. You know, I had to get pretty creative, and, I, and, and so I had to do some things that, that I wouldn't have had to do had I been of age to buy it myself. And alcoholism is a very, very brutal illness on, on, on young people. It's a very brutal illness on young people. It's a brutal illness on all of us, but it, it comes on fast and it hits hard. And, you know, there was a moment where I just felt like it was holding my head underwater and there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. I didn't understand that I had alcoholism. I wasn't interested really in exploring that when I, when I was drinking. I was just interested in making sure that I had enough every single day so that I didn't have to draw a sober breath. And what happened for me is I finally got caught. It was that simple. Um, when I was 15 years old, like I said, I was a sophomore in high school. I had a 3.8 grade point average. I was playing three varsity sports. I was president of my class. Everybody loved me. And I was the kid that every mother wanted her son to date. And at the same time, I'm absolutely drinking the clock round. I'm drinking at lunch. I'm drinking after school. I'm drinking before school. If I was crafty enough to be able to save some, I couldn't, I, I could not get through an eight hour period of school without starting to go into withdrawal. And for those of you who are daily drinkers and there were those days when you couldn't quite get enough, you know how rough that is just to get through the day. And I was absolutely coming apart at the seams. And I had abs I was living two completely different lives. There was a life I was living at school and I was checking all the boxes and making sure that that's what everybody saw. And then I was living this other side, this other life that happened when I would cross the tracks when no one was looking and I would get the stuff that I needed and I would suffer the consequences of spending too much time over there. And my mom finally came home and she and I and I got caught and it was it was a big deal in a really little town and uh, and there were warrants out for the arrest of some of these people that I shouldn't have been hanging out with in the first place and it was just a, it was just an enormous mess. Um, I have one sister. She's a couple of years older than I am, and my sister did drugs and I drank. That way there was no conflict of interest in our house. <laughs> and uh, she and I looked alike, and we ran scams together, and we, I mean, we were thick as thieves. And um, anyway, and we both got caught that night, and it was and it was pretty ugly. And um, and finally, and the school found out what was going on, and the guidance counselor called me into her office on Monday morning, and she was like, what in the world happened at your house? You know, and I made up some lies and whatnot, and I told her, I said, well, you know, that my, you know, my dad's alcoholic. And she said, yes, honey, we all know that. And I said, well, I've had a little something to drink a couple of times. And she said, okay. And I said, and it's just not going very well. And she said, well, obviously. And I said, well, and, you know, and at this point I'd been, I'd been drinking every single day and unable to, unable to draw a sober breath for at least six months, maybe nine. It's all pretty fuzzy. 
And I said, you know, I said, I, so I'm just having a little something to drink every now and then. And, you know, alcoholism runs in families and I just don't know what we're going to do about this. And, 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 and I, and there was one girl from my school who had gone away to a 10 day inpatient detox program in Cleveland, Ohio, or it was an assessment program rather. And so, and so we knew that there was a program out there for kids who are suffering with alcoholism or drug addiction or whatever, and they'd ship us off. And I asked her, I said, well, what about that program? Maybe I need to go be assessed. Because here was the deal. Everybody in that little town was really mad. And the people on the wrong side of the tracks, now not only were they very angry, but there were warrants out for their arrest, and they moved to that little town to live off the radar. And all of a sudden, they're in the middle of the radar again. And so it's just a bad deal, and I need to get out of town. And I'm 15 years old, and I'm high drama anyway. And so I made it much bigger than it was. And so the guidance counselor at school, she said, absolutely, I can get you in there tonight. And I was like, tonight? <laughs> That's fast. <laughs> you know, I had affairs to get in order. You know, I don't know what affairs a 15-year-old had to get in order, but I had affairs to get in order. You know, I didn't have a plan. I mean, I didn't, didn't even have the address. I mean, if I'm going to go somewhere for 10 days, I mean, I got some things I have to set up. You know, because when the counselors go to sleep, i got to get out of there and go get a little something to drink. But I don't even know what neighborhood I'm going to be in in Cleveland, so I've got to figure this out first. And she says, well, she says, okay. And she gives me two weeks. She said, in two weeks, you're going to go into the hospital program in downtown Cleveland. And I was like, that's perfect. Two weeks. I can figure this out in two weeks. I'm a big planner. Big planner. Drinking every day and just planning all kinds of things and never executing them well. And so I run into a guy who lives a couple of blocks from me. He's not quite on the wrong side of the tracks, but he hangs out there, too. And I run into him in the neighborhood, and, and, he's, <laughs> and he said, my God, what in the world happened? He's like, you are in quite a jam. And I'm like, I know. We put the word out that they're sending me away to the hospital. They're locking me up, and I'm going to be punished, and everything's going to be fine. And he said, well, I'll put out the word. He's like, where are you going? I said, Glen Bay Hospital in downtown Cleveland. And he said, really? He said, you're going into the adolescent part? And I said, yeah. And he said, you know, they lock that unit. I said, they do what? He said, they lock the adolescent unit. And I thought, well, what am I going to do then? Because my plan is, as soon as the counselors go to sleep or until they, and, until they go on to a thin staff at night, I'm going to sneak out and go drink on the streets of Cleveland because being sober is not really an option. And he said, yeah, he said, they, they lock that unit. And I said, oh, my God. I have no plan. I don't know what I'm going to do. I was, and I just looked at him and I said, but... I have to drink. And he said, I know you do. And I said, what am I going to do? And he said, I'd figure out a way to not go to that hospital if I was you. And so I decided I was going to drink myself to death. That seemed like my only reasonable option at the time. You know, honesty or asking for true help or any of that kind of stuff. That just didn't even cross my mind. I just thought I was going to drink myself to death because I knew that I was pretty close anyway. I knew that every single day I was drinking, I was drinking so much that my body was really, really hurting. And so I decided I was going to drink myself to death, and I, and I chased it down like I had never chased down anything. And I came to in downtown Cleveland in Glen Bay Hospital on a Monday, Monday evening, and I had been in a blackout for four days. And they didn't believe that adolescents were real alcoholics, and so I wasn't in the middle of a medical detox. They just put me in a room where everything was bolted down. They put pajamas on me, and they just let us shake, rattle, and roll in there. And so I walked through a detox period. It took me 10 days to be able to, you know, sit upright, keep down solid food, all of those kinds of things. Um, and what happened for me while I was in, in the hospital for those first couple of days and I was in that blackout is that I told them the truth. I had no intention of telling anybody the truth. I knew that I drank too much. I knew that I drank too often. I, I knew that. I knew that what I was doing <clears throat> was not right and was not acceptable for someone my age. It wasn't acceptable for anybody really. So I wasn't going to tell anybody the truth. I wasn't interested in getting sober. I was just interested in getting out of town. But I had told them the absolute truth. I told them how much I was drinking, how often, with who, all of it. And so by the time I came to, I had a chart, and on the front of that chart, there was a red stamp that said alcoholic on it. And what they do when they stamp your chart with alcoholic is that means that you don't go home after 10 days. My plan is I'm going to be gone 10 days. Their plan is that they're sending me downstairs for treatment. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. 
So they give me my, back my clothes. They put me on the elevator. They send me down one floor. Counselors get me from the elevator. And as they're showing me to my room and giving me my new pile of blankets and pillow, they call the code. And as they're calling the code, I stop one of the guys and I said, what in the world's going on? And he, he said, your sister's here. And it seems that not only did I get honest about what I'd been doing while I was in that blackout, I also got honest about what she was doing when I was in that blackout. And so they called my mom at home and they said, you got another one. As soon as we get this one processed downstairs, you're going to have to bring her in. And they tricked my sister. They said, don't you want to go visit Deb? And she was like, absolutely. I mean, we were running buddies and we haven't seen each other for 10 days. You know, when I left town, she was in juvie jail. You know, my sister was the one, she'd do drugs and she wouldn't come home and she'd get in all kinds of trouble. And so she was in and out of juvie jail all the time. And um, and she'd been in juvie jail. So I, you know, we hadn't seen each other in a while. And so they bring her in to see me. And the door closes and locks behind her. They throw her pajamas and tell her that she's going to stay. <laughs> and she ripped that place apart. She absolutely tore up that nurse's station. And so 10 days later, here comes my sister, because they're going to keep her for treatment, too, based on my intel. And so her little chart said drug addict on the front of it, and here she comes. And when she gets downstairs, I'm so excited to see her because I haven't seen her in so long, and I run up and I go to hug her, and she just looked at me and she said, don't go to sleep. (laughs) So I spent the last 20 days I had in treatment wide awake trying to avoid my sister they put us in an adjoining room because we were siblings they thought that was a good idea so she had full access to me when I was weakest and um and I so I spent 40 days in a in a in an adolescent treatment facility in downtown Cleveland trying to learn as little as possible and just counting down the days until I could get out of there and have a drink because here's the deal I don't do sobriety I don't do sobriety when I'm sober I'm freaking miserable I'm absolutely miserable. I can't stop the merry-go-round that's going on in my head. I see the faces and the situations, and I, I relive the moments, and I relive everything that I had done, whether it was by choice or not by choice, and it's just nonstop. And I can't breathe, and I can't sit still, and I, and I can't look in the mirror, and I, I can barely take a shower because I know that I'm absolutely and utterly worthless. I know that I'm absolutely and utterly worthless, and I am just not interested. I'm not interested in being in that kind of pain. I'm not interested in any of it. I just want to have a drink because I need some relief. You know, the moment that I that I have any sobriety whatsoever, my shoulders go back up on my ears, and my little hands go back up, and they're balled up into fists, and I've got no skills for sobriety at all. Absolutely none. And I have messages that I play over and over and over in my head, and the messages are are absolutely, well, one of the things that I would replay over and over was when when we were little kids, I was four or five, and so my sister was six or seven years old. And we're sitting at our little kid table in the corner of the kitchen, and my parents are having another one of their shouting matches about whatever. And I remember, and it had something to do with my mom had spent some money on something for us. And I just remember my dad, he looked at my mom and and he pointed to us and he said, they're never going to amount to anything anyway. I don't know why you're spending our money on them. And I remember looking at my sister and my sister took that on board and she kind of collapsed into herself. And she believed every word he said. And I looked at him and what I remember thinking is, how can somebody so big be so wrong? But it still stuck, and it still sat right in the middle of who I was and what I believed to be true. And so those are the kinds of things that I'm replaying and reliving when I'm, when I'm completely sober, and I'm just really not all that interested in it at all. And so I get out of that treatment center after being in there for 40 days, and now I am, I am sober for 40 freaking days. I have no skills. I have no relief. They haven't allowed me to drink. They haven't even, I mean, these counselors, they stay awake all night. I mean, don't think I wasn't up and doing a little recon trying to figure out how to get out of that hospital because I was, you know, I wasn't interested because all they do to me in treatment, they were talking, talking. 
It's group therapy, it's individual therapy, it's lectures, it's meetings. It's, I mean, it's just talk, 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 talk. And I'm thinking, would you people just shut up? I mean, for the love of God, just, if you just give me a drink, everything would be fine. Everything would be fine if you just give me a drink. I just need a little relief for the love of God. So I'm sober for 40 days. They let me out of treatment. When I'm leaving, my sister grabs me when I'm getting on the elevator, and she said, you don't relapse until I get out of here. <laughs> you will not be at home drinking while I'm in this place because of you. She said, you go to our people and you get our stuff, but you wait. I said, fine. Ten days. Ten days. I have no idea why I waited, but I waited for ten days for my sister to get home. She comes rolling in the driveway, and I go running out to the car, and I'm so excited because I got myself a couple of fifths, and, and I got my sister some random baggies of whatever it was she was into at the time. And, and everything's in the floorboard upstairs, and we are ready to roll. I am so excited because now I'm sober for 50 freaking days. 50 you, that's a long time to be sober when you got no interest in being sober. You know what I'm saying? And I just need a drink, and it's right there. It's right there. And I go grab her from the car, and I take her upstairs, and I lift the floorboard, and I show her the staff, and I was like, tonight it's on. And she said, well, they called it a spiritual experience. <laughs> I said, they? Who's they? Who's they? She said, the counselors, they called it the spirit. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, I had a little thing happen the last couple of days I was in treatment, and I think that we're going to go stay, we're going to go be sober. And I said, no, we're not going to go be sober. And she said, yes. She said, we're not, we're not relapsing tonight. And I said, yes, we are. <laughs> and she said, no. She said, we're going to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, Alcoholics Anonymous, you don't even drink. And she said, well, they said N.A. sucks. I have to go to A.A. <laughs> so off we go to A.A., and here's how we do it. My ma drops us off. Cool points, gone immediately. My ma drops us off 15 minutes before the meeting starts. We stand outside. We bum cigarettes. I don't smoke, but I learn. We stay outside until we're late, at least five or ten minutes late. Everybody else goes in for the meeting, and we stay out there. And then when we go down into the meeting, we walk through the center of the room, make as much noise as possible. The church basements, they didn't have carpet. They just had old concrete floors, and we had the metal folding chairs at most of the meetings. And I would take the chair, and I'd drag it across the floor so that it would you know, bounce around and make as much noise as possible. I didn't like coffee, but I had three cups at every meeting. I mean, up, down, up, down, up, down. I would talk. I would write notes. I would try to get dates with men who thought adolescent newcomers were cute. <laughs> I can still pick you out. <laughs> I was a complete and utter disruption at every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I went to. Absolutely a complete and utter disruption. I didn't want to be in an AA meeting. I didn't want to be sober. I was there, and somehow I was making it your fault. So I'm going to these AA meetings. I'm always late. I'm always making a ruckus. I'm absolutely, I'm just, I'm a miserable kid inside your meetings, and I am there, and I don't want to be there. Because here's the deal. You know what you're doing? You're talking. Talking isn't helping me. I just want everybody in my life to shut up. And I want somebody to give me permission to go have a drink. For the love of God, can a girl just get a drink? And then you people, at the end of your meetings, you'd circle up. You'd bow your heads and you'd say the Lord's Prayer. Well, here's the deal. I don't know the words of the Lord's Prayer. There's a lot of words in the Lord's Prayer. I don't know them, and you're not going to pull my punk card like that. And so when you people would circle up at the end of the meeting... I would slink along the back wall, and I would leave. I wasn't interested in praying. You weren't going to make me pray. I don't know what God had to do with this anyway. If I could just get a drink, I'd be fine. Thank you very much. And the president of Alcoholics Anonymous, his name was Max Shadburn. <laughs> and Max Shadburn was about 80 years old, and he had been sober since Christ was a child. 
and Mac's post was right by the entry door, which is in the back of the room. And that's where he sat. And Mac and his guys, they made up the greeting line. So every time you walked into the meeting, you had to go through the gauntlet if you got into the meeting on time. And But that was where Mac sat. And Mac would argue out loud during the meeting with a lovely woman. Her name was Jane. I hated her. She sat right up front. She had also been sober since Christ as a child. She was very old. And she would sit right up front where Polly's sitting and, and, and um, by the podium. And here's how Jane would arrive at meetings. Everybody would, everybody would be milling about the meeting room, and there was a parking space out back, and nobody parked there. It was reserved for Jane. A member of Alcoholics Anonymous would drive into the meeting with Jane in the car. Somebody would yell downstairs, and they'd say, Jane's here. And four newcomers would go grab a high back wooden chair. They'd carry it out car side. They'd gently load Jane into it. They would carry her down into the meeting. They would place her right there at the table where she belonged. She was old and she had white hair and it was pulled back in a bun and she had a glow around her. And she smoked cigarettes on an extender. She got the only crystal ashtray in the joint. You know, the rest of us had the metal ones where you put out cigarettes for so long the bottoms get wobbly. And no matter how much you scrub them, they never come clean. So she gets the only crystal ashtray in the joint. She's sitting right up front. Everybody can't wait to go up and talk to Jane. And she knew everybody's names, and she knew all about your families, and she'd ask relevant questions, and it was she just was so freaking lovely. I avoided her. I never went up to the front of the room. I wasn't getting it. I didn't know what was going on up there, but I knew that I wanted nothing to do with it. Thank you very much. But Mac and Jane, they would argue with one another in the body of the meeting about whatever. Somebody said something wrong. Somebody cursed from the podium, whatever the, whatever the thing would have been, and they, and they would argue with one another. And for the love of everything, do not quote the big book in front of those people because if you misquote it, They'd stop the meeting right there, and we'd all have to get out our books and look it up. I mean, they were absolutely incorrigible, those two. And they never agreed about anything. They never agreed about anything. And so I'm going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going in late. I'm acting badly. I'm leaving early. I'm an utter and complete disruption. I think that people are just kind of ignoring me. No big deal. I'm watching my sister, whose interest in Alcoholics Anonymous is waning very, very quickly, My sister's a drug addict. She's not an alcoholic. She was in the wrong room. She never heard her story sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We weren't telling her story. So I was watching her interest in in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous wane very, very quickly. And I'm sneaking out of the, I'm sneaking out one night when you guys are getting ready to circle up. I can now tell when the prayer is getting ready to come so I can get an early start headed toward that door. And I go to sneak out of the room and I bump into something. And I look over because I'm sneaking with my back against the wall, sliding down, and I bump in, and I look up, and it's Mac. He's taken a position in the doorway, and he just looked at me over top of his glasses, and he said, get in the circle. (laughs) So I got in the circle. And I bowed my head really low so my hair would cover up my face so that you wouldn't know that I didn't know how to pray. And as soon as that prayer was over, I went back to the door, and Mac had not moved. He didn't get in the circle. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, Are you alcoholic? And I gave him the only answer that I had. And he said, Can you control your drinking? I'm thinking, Man, you people are obsessed with this controlled drinking thing. I mean, you're obsessed. Like, why would you control your drinking? What am I going to have, two and just knock the edge off? I'm going for complete relief here. But, oh, no, can I control any drug? I don't know if I can control my drinking. I'm not interested in controlling my drinking. Thank you very much. It's some weird exercise that you people are obsessed about, but I don't know. Thank you very much. And that's the conversation that I have in my head, and so I give them the only answer that I have. I don't know. Who tries to control their drinking? When you're drinking out of the neck of the bottle and you're just going straight for oblivion, why would you stop halfway there? You know, what am I going to do? You know, come home from, you know, I don't know, 10th grade and, you know, make a drink on the rocks? Come on. And he reaches in his pocket and he hands me five bucks and he said, here's five bucks, go find out. Go try to control your drinking. He said, if you can't control your drinking... 
you get back here. If you can control your drinking, I never want to see you again. (laughs) We are tired of you treating Alcoholics Anonymous like a joke. This is a matter of life and death for us. And I went and I found my sister, and I'm like, go get your five bucks. We're out of here. (laughs) Oh, man. Man, this is all I've been waiting for, people. I mean, now I have... I have been sober like over a hundred days. Over a hundred. That's ridiculous. I've been sober a long time. And I got no interest in being sober. I'm just waiting for someone with some authority to tell me that it's okay to go out and, and, and to drink again. And he just did. And so my sister and I, we go out and we drink. I drink. She does her stuff. And But I heard him. So I was going to have three shots and two beers, because to me that was moderate drinking. I thought, I'm going to do this little, you know, controlled drinking thing. You know, you people have gotten enough information into my head. I was going to do something with it. So I was going to have three shots and two beers. To me, you know, I never used a shot glass. That meant three swigs right out of the neck of the bottle. So three shots and two beers, and I did that, and I did it really fast. And then I sat and I waited. Because here's the thing. I know that I drink too much. I know that the fact that I drink as much as I drink makes me cross the tracks. I know that crossing the tracks is my real problem. I know that the things that happen over there wouldn't happen to me if I didn't drink a fifth of vodka a day. If I just drank less than that, I wouldn't have to go there every day. If I could stretch that out, if a bottle could just last me three or four days, I'd be fine. Maybe I could even figure out a different way to pay for it. So I have three shots and two beers because I think I am missing the mark. I'm going a little bit, I'm going a little bit overboard. I got to figure out how to ration this stuff and stretch it out. And I'm sitting there at three shots and two beers and my shoulders have been on my ears for over a hundred days. And my hands have been balled up in fists and I can't sit still and I, and I just, and I throw up every day because I just hate what's going on and I haven't slept. And I can't brush my hair and I can't put on makeup and I, you know, eating food. I'm just not all that interested and I'm an utter and complete mess. And I have three shots and two beers and I'm like, come on, just give me a little freaking relief. And my little hands let loose a little bit and my shoulders come a little bit off my ears. And then it stops. And I think, oh, no. I think my equation's a little off. So I'm going to have one more shot and see if that will get them the rest of the way down. And I have one more shot and one more beer and one more shot and one more beer. And guess where I end up? Crossing the tracks. Because I don't I don't understand the phenomena of craving. I don't know that that's what's going on with me. I don't know that I'm mentally and bodily different from my fellows. All I know, all I know is that drinking is the only relief I've ever really known. And when I don't have that, there is no relief. And I come to you the next morning, and I'm beat up, and I'm bruised, and I'm sick, and I have no idea what happened. I'm a blackout drinker, thank God. I remember enough. And I come out of this blackout, and I am an utter and complete wreck. And you know what I hear in my head? If it doesn't work, you get back here. And I thought, oh, man, you got to be kidding me. I got to go to AA now. I got to really go to AA now. I walked back into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. It was March 15th, 1987. I got there on time. I sat in the middle. I only had one cup of coffee. And I got in your damn circle. And when I'm leaving that meeting, Max Shadburn was standing back in the door again. And I walk up to leave that meeting as soon as the prayer is over, because I'm not staying for any of this, you know, glad-handing, hugging crap that you guys got going on. And I'm headed for the door, and Max stands there, and he's filling up the door like the night he tossed me out. And he looked at me, and he said, did you get a sponsor? (laughs) And I'm like, how did he even know I'd been out drinking? And I looked at him, and I said, no. And he said, get a sponsor before you leave this room. And I had heard women with women, men with men, whatever. So I walked up to every woman in that room, and I said, will you sponsor me? And every woman in that room said, no. (laughs) Uh Uh-uh. No, sweetie, no. They weren't even offering me really good excuses. You know, there are some good excuses that we have for not sponsoring. 
oh, no, I have too many. No, I just got a new job. No, I had a baby. I mean, there are all kinds of excuses women use for getting out of sponsorship duties. But they weren't even offering excuses. They were just saying no. <laughs> and so I walked back up to leave the room, and Mac had not moved. And he said, well, did you get a sponsor? And I said, no one in this room will sponsor me. He said, that's a lie. I said, I'm not asking her. He said, oh, yes, you are. And I said, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and he just pointed his finger and he goes. And I walked up to Jane and I had to wait my turn. <laughs> and I looked at her and she was sitting there smoking a cigarette on an extender, looking lovely as always. And I said, will you sponsor me? And she looked at me and she took a draw on her cigarette extender and she said, why should I? <laughs> it's a reasonable question. And I said something like, because I need to be sober and I don't know how. And then I thought, who said that? <laughs> you know, my plan is to tell her where to shove that cigarette extender. <laughs> That's all I got. So she agrees to sponsor me. She gives me a list of everything that I'm going to be doing differently. And the next day, I, I get home from school, and I'm pretty sure my life is over. I've just turned it over to 65-year-olds on purpose. And there's this enormous car that pulls into my driveway. Do you guys remember the Ford LTDs from the 70s? Absolutely. So there's this enormous car. Now, these cars, they have big steering wheels, and you can drive them with one finger. But when, if you want to make a right-hand turn, you've got to stop a half a block back. And so there's this car, and it pulls into my driveway, and it's really big, and so it kind of floats to a stop. And so it pulls into my driveway, and it floats to a stop, and my ma says, what in the world's going on out there? Who's that? And I said, I don't know. I'll go find out. I went outside. There's two old guys sitting in there smoking cigarettes, drinking coffee, listening to country music, laughing about something. And I knock on the window, and they roll the window down the rest of the way, and I said, can I help you? And they said, Jane sent us. Get in the car. <laughs> I argued with him a little bit and realized that I wasn't going to be able to get out of this. So I walked into the house and I, my mom was like, well, who is it? And I was like, ma, AA's here. <laughs> She's like, okay, honey, have fun. <laughs> and what I didn't know and what I didn't find out for a little while is that they had, a, they had had a group conscience meeting. And they'd said, what in the world are we supposed to do with these girls? They are ruining Alcoholics Anonymous. And Max said, by God, I think we ought to throw them out. And there was a man, his name was Bill, and Bill didn't say much, ever. Bill's a very simple, very quiet man. His Ford LTD was maroon in color. And Bill piped up in the back of that meeting after they were talking about throwing us out for a while, and he, says, and he said something like, well, I figure if God gave them to us, they're ours. And we should probably put them on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and see if it takes, don't you think? And so Max still got to throw us out. He was very committed. And they said, well, who in the world's going to sponsor him? And everybody looked around the room and there were no hands. And another one of the really quiet guys, one of my heroes in Alcoholics Anonymous, he said something like, I believe that these girls are really damaged. And I think that the only, the only person who can sponsor them is someone who's at least the age of their grandmother. Because they've been really damaged by people their parents' age and by people younger than them. And so it's going to have to be one of our older members. And everybody looked at Jane. And Jane said, I can't do it. I'm too, I don't have enough energy. I'm too tired. And everybody in that meeting said, if you'll sponsor them, we'll help. And so the group, everybody in that group, they took a job to get us sober. I had a Monday crew, a Tuesday crew, a Wednesday crew, a Thursday crew, a Friday crew, a Saturday crew, and a Sunday crew. And each one of my crews, they had a specialty area. 
They came and got me every single night, every single night. And I have no idea how long it took, but at some point, instead of hoping that they wouldn't come and that I'd get a night off from Alcoholics Anonymous, I started standing by the front door looking out, waiting for them to get there. And looking forward to my Tuesday crew. And I knew who was coming to get me on Friday, and boy, did I have some questions for them. And here was the deal. When you get sober in Northeast Ohio, you know, 26 years ago, you don't just go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, no. you got to go to the freaking donut shop after the meeting. And what you talk about at the donut shop, everything you just talked about at the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. So not only do, do I not understand what you guys are talking about at meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, because I don't understand the language of the heart yet, but I have to listen to people dissect it again at the donut shop. And here's the thing. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't know God. I had no idea. If there was a God, I'm pretty sure he wasn't going to have anything to do with me. Somehow I had picked up the idea that there was, a, there was a, this idea about sin and right and wrong and, and that if, and, and that I had probably, I had, I'd probably acted about as badly as any human being could have acted. So if there was a God, he wasn't going to have anything to do with me. I didn't know anything about forgiveness. My family didn't forgive. We were champion grudge holders. Champion grudge holders. I mean, there were decades when family members wouldn't talk to one another, and there was, and you asked them why, and most of the time they couldn't tell you, but we were champion grudge holders. And that's what I had been given. And members of Alcoholics Anonymous showed up to pick me up, whether I had been a brat or not the week before, they showed up anyway. No matter what kind of stupid question I asked, no matter how badly I, I acted in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, they showed up anyway. They never asked me for gas money. I never had to buy my own donut or my own cup of coffee because they knew that we were really poor. And I would sit at the donut shop, and they would trick me into getting onto the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. They tricked me into getting on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I had the folks, and it was their job to walk me through the doctor's opinion in the, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous because they knew what I didn't know was that I wasn't going to be able to justify my seat here based on how many times I had been to jail, how many cars I had wrecked, and how many kids I had had that I had neglected or abandoned. I had none of that. So they were going to have to walk me through the doctor's opinion in, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and show me what alcoholism really is and talk to me about the phenomena of craving and get me to tell them my story. And they weren't really interested in everything that happened to me while I was drinking. What they were interested in was what happens to you when you do drink. And they helped me take step one, which is what I needed, which is what I needed to sit still in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then I had my God squad. Oh, they talked incessantly about God. It was just God, this God, that God, this God, that. Pray about it, pray about it, pray about it, pray about it. And I thought, oh, for the love of you know, you people are just obsessed with this God stuff. But they were really sneaky. They would sit at the donut shop and they would tell me their own stories. And what they would do is they would outline how they had been forgiven, how they had been restored to proper place in society at their jobs with their families. They would outline all of that. And they would sneak in God. And I remember one night I was sitting at the donut shop. I don't know. I, I'm sober just a couple of months. And one of the guys, he went out on a limb and he asked me a question. They didn't ask me a lot of questions because they didn't want me to talk. And he asked me a question. He said, what do you think about all this God stuff? And I said, I don't know. I said, if there's a God, I'm pretty sure he isn't going to have anything to do with me. And he said, why is that? I said, I've acted really badly. I've acted really bad. And he said, well, what is really bad? And I said, I'm not going to tell you. And he said, well, let me tell you a few things. And he walked me through his story. And he had been one of those guys on in the little house on the wrong side of the tracks. Not in my little house, but in a little house just like that. And he knew the things I, I had known. He had done the things that had been done to me. He experienced the life I had lived. But he had been restored. He had been forgiven. He was in proper relationship with his fellows. He was in proper relationship with the society around him. And another guy sat and he told me his story. And he drank like my dad drank. 
And he treated his kids the way my dad had treated us. And he'd been forgiven and he'd been restored. And little by little, they introduced me to this idea of God. And they put me into a deep and effective relationship with God by sharing with me their stories and how they got into a deep and effective relationship with God. And they taught me to pray by taking my big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and highlighting all of the prayers inside that book. Because one guy was saying, you know, I was taking them, you know, my enormous life problems. And then the guy's like, you got to pray about it, you got to pray about it. And I was like, I don't know how. And he said, give me your book. And I slid my book across the table at the donut shop. He took it and he underlined it or highlighted every one of the tiny little prayers throughout the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He shoved it back and he said, pick one and try it on your knees. I said, fine. And I did, and I started to learn how to say prayers. I'd get on my knees, I'd close one eye and read with the other eye. And I would say those prayers, and and then I started to learn the prayers, and I could close both eyes. There was a man in my group who had a rock as a higher power when he got sober. He wasn't one of our spiritual giants, but he participated. And there were, and there was another man in our group who was Amish. His name is Danny. And, and at several points after meetings, the guy with the rock as a higher power and the Amish men would be sitting next to one another and we would be talking about spiritual matters. And both of them had input. And they seemed to get along with one another. And they spent time listening to one another and exchanging ideas. And what they taught me that they didn't know they were teaching me was that the, the highway really is broad. It's roomy and it's all inclusive. You know, because the guy with the rock with the higher power, he was allowed to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the guy who was Amish, who seemed to, you know, live and breathe God, there was room for him in Alcoholics Anonymous. And most of us probably live somewhere in between. And they taught me that and they showed me that. And little by slow, I started to pray, and I started to have a little bit of belief and then a little bit of trust. And then all of that eventually became faith. Fast forward 22 years. I've spent 22 years in Alcoholics Anonymous abandoning various parts of my life to him, just giving it up completely. I gave up my education. I gave up my jobs. I gave up where I lived. I gave up relationships. I just turned in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all a little bit at a time. You know, I never, I never overly defined God. I never, you know, I didn't, hadn't gone to church. I hadn't done any of that kind of stuff. I just absolutely participated in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And every time I'd sponsor someone and I would watch the light come on, my relationship with God would deepen. Every single time a prayer was said and a prayer was answered and I was able to draw that line between what was asked and what was delivered, my faith would deepen. Every single time I would sit in a ballroom like this and I would listen to people who had gone before me talk about their relationship with God, I would pick out little nuggets of that and my faith and my relationship with God would deepen. That's why we get together. Every single time, it just deepened. And so I had this incredibly rich, give-and-take relationship with God for a couple of decades, just as a regular member of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, what those old guys did for me at the donut shop, and these are just regular blue-collar guys, what they did is they invited me to the dance floor, and then they handed me over to God when he cut in. And then they kept the music playing. And I'm 22 years sober, or 18 years sober. Anyway, I had abandoned every single area of my life to God except one. I kept boys for my own. I was going to manage that. Thank you very much. And so I picked my own boys. I, you know, I had relationships with all kinds of men. I had a great, you know, just and had a full, rich, deep relationship and learned a lot and kind of moved through my life. I was married and divorced once. You know, if, you know, if you're bored in your home group, give that a try. Um <laughs> They'll get everybody talking. They'll show up at the meeting just to find out what happened. Um, and and God had been coming to me over and over and over and over. He had been coming to me. I had been doing I've been doing daily inventories because I know that things in my life just are not right. 
every single day I become very, very committed to using the 10 step in my life. And I'm taking a look and I, cause I know like I can't sit still anymore. I'm not sitting in my own skin. I'm not outwardly acting badly, but something's not right. And so I'm doing inventory after inventory after inventory. I'm going over it with people who care very much for me and who know me very, very well. And we're peeling that onion. And finally, one of them had enough courage to say, I think that you're supposed to deepen your relationship with God again. And I said, but I've given him everything. I mean, I give him every waking moment. I give him meeting. I mean, I am, I'm a dedicated, I'm a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, for the love of God, I travel, I talk, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, I am just giving everything I have to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was raised here. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I sponsor people. I do everything I'm supposed to do. What more could he possibly want? And they said, that's a question for him. I can't answer that, but I think it's time for you to get busier. And so I'm in, and I'm, and I'm in this give and take with God, and he and I, we are, we are, I am on my knees in prayer and meditation. That's the only place that I'm comfortable. A couple of months of daily inventories trying to figure out what in the world's going on. I'm at the state convention in Louisiana in 2005, right before the storm. And there's a man who shows up there. His name is Walter Hall, and he's, he's a, you know, little guy who's an old timer from Houston, Texas. And Walter has some funny ideas about things, and I just adore him. And I met him there at that conference, and he walks up to me, and he says, for some reason, I think I'm here for you this weekend. He said, I'm usually, he said, every time I come to one of these, he said, my story isn't one of those big mainstream stories. He said, I'm not famous in an anonymous program. But when I am sent somewhere, he said, I'm usually sent to do something for somebody very specific, and I think I'm here for you. And I looked at him and I said, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And he said, (laughs) he said, yeah, you probably are. He said, but you need to stay really close to me this weekend. He said, because I don't know when it's going to come. He said, but he said, I can tell you this. When I talk on Sunday morning, you better be sitting next to my wife with some tissues because I think I got a message for you. And I was like, huh, I'm a speaker. I'm fine. I won't be doing any spiritual soul searching this weekend. And God had absolutely other ideas, and he kept me on my knees, and he, and he just kept me fidgety, and I just cried all weekend. On Friday morning, it's 5 in the morning, and, I am, and I'm exhausted. I'd been up drinking really strong coffee and eating beignets till 3 in the morning. And at 5 a.m., I'm on my knees in prayer and meditation, and I'm like, and it's actually prayer at that moment, and I was like, God, what do you want? And he said, I want the rest. I want the rest. And I knew what he'd been talking about. There was a man in my life. His name was Lee. And Lee was six foot one and bald head and blue eyes. And he was a major in the Marine Corps. And he and I adored one another, head over heels in love with one another. Lee had absolutely no relationship with God at all. Didn't pray, didn't acknowledge God, nothing. I had a deep and effective relationship with God. And I thought I'm going to be, I'm spiritual enough for both of us. It'll be just fine. He and I had been dating each other for a couple of years, and we rode Harleys together, and we golfed together, and we were just, we were absolutely, absolutely hitting it out of the park together. And when God said, I want the rest, I said, no. And he said, I have perfect love to give you, and you continue to block me. And I said, I got it, good. Have you seen him? (laughs) I got this. I got this. You see, because when I got really sober, when I had worked all the steps and I had cleaned, I cleaned my house and all of, the, all of the promises of Alcoholics Anonymous were coming true in my life and I was living the kind of experience that we live together when we are in fellowship with one another. I had all of that. I had all of that and I didn't think that there was anything left. I didn't think that there was anything more. I didn't think there was anything more. I traded in the insanity of the next drink for the insanity of self-reliance. And I would take that one off the shelf every now and then and take it for a good, strong walk around the block. And if you ever hear me say this, I got it, please, please intervene. Because I'm completely functioning in self-will. But that's what I would do in these relationships. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I hear you, but I got it. I got it. And God absolutely drove me, drove me to a level of surrender I had never known that weekend.
You see, I had continued to work the 10th and 11th step. Those two, are, those two things are very, very much integrated for me. You know, it, it no longer was enough to be walking around with my li- original list of character defects from the fourth step and just acknowledge every now and then when I was being a little manipulative and I was functioning on fear a little bit. That was no longer enough. That's where I started. But I would take those defects of character and they became very glaring for me as I would continue to use the 10th step in my life. And, 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 and the ways in which I would choose to live on self rather than live on God would be revealed to me every single night when I would do a 10th step. Every single night when I would do a 10th step. So I was, I was growing and I, and I was growing in the idea and the relationship with God and it was absolutely amazing. And I thought I had it all. And so when I got home from that conference, so I sat next to Walter's wife and Walter got up and he gave his talk that morning and he started telling the story about the carpenter. And he he, he just gave this really powerful, very, very spiritual talk that had a lot of heavy religious overtones to it. Now, I knew that God wanted me to become Catholic. He'd been trying to have that conversation with me for at least five years. And I kept saying, no, thank you. No, absolutely not. And God kept saying, look, there are, there are spiritual tools here, and I can't teach you how to use them if you don't get close to the, to the toolbox. Come and hang out in the toolbox so that, I, so that I can give you these tools. And I kept saying no. And Walter delivered the messenger of the carpenter, and I absolutely wept nonstop. I went home from that conference. I went, I went to dinner with Lee on Monday, and I said, I'm sorry, but I have to break up with you. I have to go have this relationship with God, and you're in my way. Because I had, I, had, I had started to rely on, on man for things that I should have been relying on God for. That was my M.O. in relationships. God and I are really, really close, and I listen to him, and I do everything that he wants me to do until there's a cute boy. <laughs> and then I would transition over, and I would start to rely on man for the things that God had been providing for me. And it got in my way over and over and over and over. And Lee looked at me over dinner, and he said, let me get this straight. You're leaving me for God. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, are you sure there's not another man? And I said, oh, God, no, that would be really easy. And so I, I, I ended that relationship, and I walked in, and I saw the priest the next day, and I was like, all right, look, I don't have time to go into all this with you, but I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be Catholic. I don't know why. Sprinkle me, dunk me, do whatever it is got to do to me. <laughs> Supposedly, you got some, you know, super high-speed spiritual tools here that I have to get my hands on, so, you know, let's get this show on the road. And he said, whoa, whoa. <laughs> he said, boy, you're really happy to be here. And I was like, I don't have time for this conversation. As soon as I can get to these spiritual tools, learn how to use them, I can get back to him. Uh, what I didn't know is it was going to take me a year to figure out what the Catholic Church was and what that meant and what those spiritual tools were and all of that kind of stuff because I got to make a decision as to whether or not I went that route. And what I didn't know is that Lee had left that conversation. He went and he sat down with his battalion chaplain and said, Chaps, Deb left me. And the chaplain said, well, my God, man, why? What would you do? And he said, she's going to become Catholic. What am I supposed to do? She said, I'm in her way. She said she was relying on me for things she should have been relying on God for. What am I supposed to do? And the chaplain looked at him and said, well, man, Deb's pretty great. I think I'd go to Mass if I were you. (laughs) And so Lee came and found me a couple of months later, and and he became Catholic with me. We we entered the Catholic Church together. We put God square in the middle of, of, of our relationship. We entered it um, in 2006 at Easter, and then um, we got married in June. And then in August, he left to go to Iraq and take some guys with him. And they went to Iraq, and they had they had a very, very difficult deployment. Um, they were living outside the wire in the streets of Fallujah with the Iraq army. and um, But he brought his entire team home. And while he was gone, what was really, really great is that because of the work that he and I had done together, we now had a spiritual language that we could use in our communication with one another. You see, he didn't have the program of Alcoholics Anonymous to rely on. He didn't have it. He needed he needed something to come from, from the larger world in order to have that, that kind of language. And when he would call me, I could ask him questions like, how is it that I can pray for you? And so I was able to participate and I was able to support him through that wartime deployment. He came back and then his, his deployment to Afghanistan got moved up. He was only home for a few months and he went and he did workups and he went to Afghanistan. He snapped in as the XO of the battalion, which means he was the, essentially the vice president of a 1200 man company and away he went. 
And in that deployment, they lost many, many men. And when he would, when he would contact me via email or via phone, I was his best friend and he would share everything that was happening to him over there. Every single thing. There was a time when I didn't want to open an email from him because I opened an email one day and it said another IED, honey, nothing left but a boot. And I can tell you that what happened for me is that while I'm at home and I can't do anything to protect him, I can't do anything to change his circumstances, I can't do anything at all for him over there other than stay plugged into my only true source of power. And I can tell you that my prayer life deepened, my meditation life deepened. I was absolutely open to anything that God had to offer me, anything that God could offer me. And I was able to spend time with other women who had deployed husbands, and I was able to sponsor in a way I'd never sponsored before. And I was absolutely able to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into a relationship with God. And Lee came home from that deployment. And by the time he came home from that deployment, I was actively practicing the presence of God daily in my life. Every single moment of every single day, I had an awareness that God was with me. When I was kneeling in the morning beside my bed to say my prayers, God was kneeling right there beside me and had his arm around my shoulders and we would have a conversation. When I was driving to work in the morning, he was sitting in the passenger seat. When I was sitting in meetings with people, God was sitting right there with me. I had this enormous sense of the presence of God, and it seemed as if it had been given to me as a gift and that I hadn't worked for it at all. It was just laid at my feet. And Lee came home from that deployment. He came home from that deployment. They had lost over 200 men. 20 of them had died, and and, uh, over 180 of them had been removed from the field of battle due to life-changing injuries. And um, and I knew that when he was over there and things were changing his heart, I knew that there were things that were happening to him that I wasn't going to be able to understand. And I, would, and I took that to God over and over and over, and I said, God, please show me how it is I'm to be of service in this way. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to bring someone the rest of the way home from war. You may deliver him to me to me physically, but I don't know how to bring him the rest of the way, so please show me. And every single day, he and I would wake up, and we, and we were continued to pray together, and we continued to spend time sitting with God together. But he was different. And a little bit at a time, he started to come home. A little bit at a time, he started to come the rest of the way. And one day, he and I started planning for the future together, and I knew that that's when I had him back. But it took some time. And then I'm and I'm working for the Marine Corps at the time, and I come home one night, and he and I both worked about a 16-hour day. Things were very, very busy. And I get and I get home, and I beat him home. I talk to him on my way home, and I said, where are you? And he said, I'm right behind you, which means he's going to be at least an hour. And um, when you're married, you figure those things out. And um, and I'm there for an hour and a half or so. I fall asleep sitting up waiting on him to get home to eat a bite of dinner for, uh, with me before we go to sleep um, and so that we can say our nightly prayers together. And and all of a sudden I just I wake up and I look around and I know that something's not right. And I call the battalion and I said, has anybody seen Major Helton, one of the captains who's not supposed to be there at 930 at night? He gets on the phone and he said, and after some give and take, I convinced him to tell me what was wrong. And he said, I'm so sorry, Deb, but Lee was killed on his way home. And I can tell you that there are going to be moments for all of us when we're going to have to rely on the relationship that we currently have with God. We're going to have to use the relationship that we currently have with God because that's going to be the only thing that we ever have. That's it. Everything else is stripped away, and that was one of my moments. And I'm standing in my kitchen, and I'm holding that phone, and I get, and I, and I get this information that takes my breath. And I said something like, God, I can't breathe. Please help me. And I'd been living in the presence of God. And God wrapped his arms around me from behind, this warm golden glow. And he whispered in my ear and he said, I'm here. He didn't say it's going to be okay. It didn't really happen. This is just a bad nightmare. Wake up. It's going to be fine. He didn't say any of that. He said, I'm here. And there were people who came and sat with me from the military that night. And when the sun started to come up, I realized I had not told them that I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had sent out three text messages in the middle of the night. And um, 
And so my group started to call in, and I told everybody what had happened throughout the night. And the sun is getting ready to come up, and, and Colonel John Reed, Lieutenant Colonel at the time, was sitting with me. And I said, oh, my God, John, there's something you need to know about me that you don't already know. And he said, okay. And I said, I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, okay. And I said, John, these, as soon as that sun gets up over that mountain, they're coming. <laughs> and he said, okay. And I said, John, they don't look like people you're used to hanging out with. And he said, okay. And I said, John, they're going to take over everything. They're going to take over absolutely everything, and you're just going to have to, you're going to, have to let them. And he said, well, okay, does this group have a leader? <laughs> I said, oh, yes, you'll know exactly who she is when she gets here. <laughs> we all have our gifts in AA. <laughs> And the sun popped up over the mountain, and, and John's face was looking toward the driveway, and my face was looking this way, and we were sitting there in silence. And I'm sitting there breathing, and God is sitting there in between us. It's just the three of us hanging out. And I watched John's face, and all of a sudden his face went, I think they're here. My friend Matthew was the first one up the driveway. Matthew is six foot four. He has multiple piercings. He wears clothes that don't match on purpose. He's gay, so he walks a little funny. <laughs> and his hair was blue. <laughs> and my house filled up. My house filled up with members of Alcoholics Anonymous. My house filled up with the military. My house filled up with members of people from my church. I wasn't sure how all this was going to go. <laughs> We could have an old-fashioned spiritual rumble right out in the backyard. I wasn't sure how we were all going to mix, but we all, thank goodness we all did just fine. And when my house is full of people, the old-timers are sitting around my kitchen table with cups of coffee because that's what they do. And they were having a conversation, and they were saying, and, and this is what they were saying to me, Deb, it's okay for you to be angry with God. He's big enough, and he can take it. You have an incredible relationship with God. You know how big he is, so it's okay to be angry. And I, and I listened to old timers and I was like, okay, be angry with God. Got it. When it comes, give it to God. Got it. Check. But in my head, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, do I really have to be angry with God? You know? And I'm looking around the room and I can see the glow of God on sitting, sitting there with all, with everyone in my house. He's there. You know, there, there are these gold cords of energy that are connecting the people that are sitting in my house. And using every single person in there for some good. And I'm just looking at that and I was like, God, isn't there another way? You're my best friend. You've gotten me through so much. You've been faithful to me when I couldn't even pray. I didn't even know who you were and you worked for me. Isn't there another way? Because I know that when I'm angry, I can't honor. I can't honor any relationship if there's anger in the middle of it. You people taught me that. And I said, God, I just don't want to do it this way. And my phone rings and it had been ringing all day. And a friend of mine, Christine, who was a member of my group, she had the phone and she was making the list of everybody who was calling. And there are, you know, lots of people on that list. And she brings me the phone and she said, this guy, it's the third time he's, he's called. And I said, okay. And she said, he said he has a message for you from God. And I said, okay, that's not an unusual call for me. And I said, who is it? And she said, it's Walter from Houston. And I said, oh, God, give me the phone because he's one of my messengers. You know, we are one another's messengers. Sometimes we just pass through. Sometimes we stay for a cup of coffee. Sometimes we move in. And Walter passes through and has a cup of coffee with me every now and then. And I get on the phone and it's Walter. And he says, darling, I love you. I'm so sorry. Walter's an old Marine and he and we were big fans of one another. I said, thank you. He said, I love you. I said, I love you too, Walter. He said, but God told me, woke me up this morning and told me to get a hold of you because he wanted me to tell you something for him. And I said, okay, go ahead. And he said, God wants you to know that there are things that happen in this world that break his heart. Lee's death was one of them. And so he will be grieving along with you. 
and you can rest in his arms. I got a hold of everybody in my house and I said, listen up. We will not be talking about being angry with God any longer. I said, there are things that happen in this world that break God's heart. Lee's death was one of them and he will be healing alongside us. So we will rest in his arms throughout this entire process. You got it. And everybody in my house went. And from that moment forward, we walked through grief in the arms of God. I was able to tell my group. I was like, look, here's the deal. I'm going to be really sad. And it's going to look really dark. And it is going to be dark sometimes. But I'm going to need you to come and visit me anyway. I'm going to need you to not be scared of my, of my sadness. Please don't be scared of my sadness. Show up and come and sit with me. I will not put an anchor around your neck and keep you there. But I'm going to need you to come and, 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 and be there with me. I said, I may not be able to hear God all the time while I'm moving through this because that's what darkness does. I'd read enough and I'd known enough people who'd gone through really difficult things. I said, so if I can't hear God, you have to show up because he'll speak through you and I'll be able to hear you when I can't hear him. And I had had the kind of relationship where I was able to hear him without you and I knew that I was going to go through moments when that was not going to be true. And my group absolutely showed up. The folks, the girls from my church, we had a little women's group, they showed up. And they came and they sat with me. And I grieved out loud and I was honest. And there were times, there were times they didn't last long when I could not, I could not see God any longer. The little, the little gold cords that were connecting us in rooms that I could see, the warmth that I could feel when he wrapped himself around me, the fact that he was beside me when I was praying beside my bed. There were moments when I was so sad that I couldn't see him anymore. And the people showed up and they sat with me and they allowed me to move through that anyway. And I was never closer to God never closer to God than I, than I have been in that initial year and a half or two years of grief. I learned so much about the grace of God. I learned so much about how he works through people. I learned so much about how we care for one another's souls. I learned so much. Remember the nun, 80 years. Oh, no, Father, you have it all wrong. It is he who has had faith in me for 80 years, not the other way around. So fear not. Go to God. Rest in his arms. And let him give you perfect love. Let him give you perfect love. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.